So, thank you for having me here today. Uh, my name is Jake Gibson Shaw Sutton, and <coughs> rather than give a full breakdown of childhood and backgrounds and every job role and involvement, I thought I'd include what well, some of the most concurrent and inclusive for what I'll be talking about today. So over the past year, I've been the Knowledge Exchange Manager for the Devon Agritech Accelerator, was engaging with uh, 80 different agricultural businesses, uh, helping them to basically create new technology and incorporate it into their farms, into their uh, practices to try and help optimize the way that they're growing, the way that they're monitoring, whether that's from animals to crops. Um, at the University of Plymouth, I'm also the robotics lead on the Recon Soil project, which is looking at the actual health of uh, soils around the UK. Because one thing that's often completely ignored is the state of soils uh, for farming. And there's been quite a few studies with some rather terrifying results. And I know there's been a lot of dare I say, scary things that have been mentioned throughout the course of today in terms of threats and issues. But in farming, with soil, if current practices continue the way that they are, in around about 30 years in the UK, the actual soil would be pretty much arid. We would not be able to grow any more plants or crops in that soil without a heavy investment in additional fertilizers and things to actually grow substances in instead of relying solely on the soil. So the Recon Soil Project's looking at how we can automatically monitor that and also create um, fresh, healthy soil, so to speak, from arid, bad soil. But what I'll be speaking to you about the most is actually the company that started up um, five years ago, Robotrics Limited, where um, we're an R&D focused robotics company based down in Cornwall, just outside of Par. And for the past five years, we've been developing an autonomous agricultural platform. And I'll get to that in a moment. In terms of getting into this sector, getting into the farming, one thing that I always like to mention during these is I did come from a farm. Growing up with a farming background in the very flatlands of Norfolk, definitely gives you a appreciation of what goes on and how in many occasions a lot of things are done for the sake of that's what is available everything is based down to cost there's a huge throughput there's a huge demand at the other end and there's a massive reliance and importance on food but in terms of how that's being made there's a few angels out in fields that are putting in day and night work to try and make that happen for us all. So I always like to try and give a shout out and always think about your local farmer. But today, so I'll be talking about agri-robotics in the field and specifically our platform, which we call the RTU, so the Robotic Traction Unit. Um, we've gone through around about well, 43 different hardware iterations of the design, over 600 simulated versions. And from the very get go, we worked with farmers in Cornwall and across Devon to actually find out, okay, what are the problems they're facing with growing, whether that's with um, tracking where their cows are getting to or finding what pests are attacking plants, crops, what parts of the region is getting a bit too boggy or getting a bit too damaged to really be able to grow. We took all those considerations in to start designing the platform and we've resulted in, I think my favourite summary of it, as posted by um, the Scotland Post a few years ago, was it's a go-kart that's crashed into some scaffolding. <laughs> so on either side there is a track and that's completely electric. Battery, everything's built in, all the electronics, all built into that side unit. And joining them is some scaffolding. And the advantage of that scaffolding means we can set the actual width and the height of that, depending on the farm. So the actual users, unlike certain tractor vendors, which shall go unnamed, we want to encourage people to really be able to modify, change, fix, not necessarily break, because that's not ideal, 
but you use it in their scenarios. So it's got applications across larger, but importantly, smaller farms. So the platform itself can operate up to 54 degree inclines before it starts to actually lose traction or become unstable. Um, and I mentioned that it's electric at full pelt. If you leave it continuously running, it will go for minimum of 24 hours. And there's a payload capacity of 400 kilos on board. So the idea is to try and make a workhorse tool. What are you going to do with this platform though? Part of that has been also creating a range of different modules and attachments from scanners. So you can take it out to a field and create a digital twin of that. Um, soil probes for actually checking the carbon content and the microbial content of your soil because there is a huge demand at the moment for how much carbon is out there but we don't actually have a way of measuring it instead it's estimated and guessed there is no thing going in the ground checking every 30 centimeters because it changes dramatically if you take your readings for your soil content behind where the tractors are parked oh you've got a lot of carbon in your soil if you take it out in the field there's very little and in terms of the value well you, you took that reading behind the track let's just say yeah that's on average across the whole farm there's a lot of variation which isn't great when you're trying to be realistic and accurate to what's actually there um, alongside that we've also been developing and creating uh, with the university of plymouth and various different interns and sponsorship programs um, picking modules so the robot can go out it can visually recognize where the weeds are if they're growing too close to the crop you can spray that weed without spraying the rest of them because the weeds are actually good for the soils which help the plants grow even more and then the platform can go out and keep track of every plant sending back and kind of keeping track of what is actually ripe what is ready to be harvested because often in agriculture harvest is a panic time it will get to, OK, you'll go out, check the crops in the field. If it's dry, if the weather's good, you've now got 24 hours to try and get as much as you can before it starts getting damaged and the actual value of it starts plummeting down. So instead, by keeping track of the plant per plant, you're able to be more selective with what you grow and where you grow. And We've had some good amounts of success over the past few years um, at various demonstrations and I apologize for including a academic from the University of Plymouth riding on the robot with a robot hand in hand. Um, adds more evidence in these type of robots when you're developing robotics for agriculture, these things will get abused used in many ways that you might not expect. Um, so here it's loaded up with almost a ton of wood. Um, we've got software checks on board. So if it detects more than around about 1.6 tons, then it will cut off. But we don't recommend people to do that because you can damage yourself. So the question then is, OK, what is the cyber risk here? I've talked about the robot. You've got this big, heavy, powerful device going around. Uh, what's the risk? And I tried to put it in the simplest possible way. A powerful robot and a squishy human, squishy animals around, delicate plants, delicate crops. If anything goes wrong, you're either going to start damaging what you've been waiting half a year or maybe an entire year to grow, or God forbid, someone or something might actually get damaged instead. And this is learned from experience. Our very first platform, rather than being tracked with a top speed of three mile an hour, it was an experiment of what could we do within a very confined um, co end cost for the user. So it had a top speed of 60 miles an hour. It didn't have a battery life of 24 hours, but instead it was around about four hours. But a 60 mile an hour speed on a device that can be controlled remotely, if there's even the slightest drop in connection, you can maintain connection. But if there's any timing difference on your packets, well, what you thought was 
safe, secure robot might lurch forward five meters before you can even blink. And I was the fortunate one in front of that and got carried away on the front crossbar. It was a good realization at that moment of, okay, a, oh, jumped a bit too far. A serious consideration for building these platforms is you need to make sure everything, and I mean everything you can imagine is on board. If you incorporate or you rely specifically on a wireless or a data or a network connection, things are going to get bad very quickly and things are going to become very difficult. In the agri-tech sector, it's very popular and very common to, and often you'll see controlled growing environments because it's a controlled environment. Out in the wilderness, though, not so much. And when you start losing that control, well, latency. If you're trying to tell it to stop and it's not stopping, that's going to cause more issues. Connectivity. You can't rely on that in the countryside. You could be somewhere where you've got perfect signal, the wind changes and suddenly your platform might think it's somewhere completely different. It might have completely lost its connecti connectivity. So how can you account for that? And the final point I just wanted to raise here is also data. So from the get go, like I mentioned, we've been working with farmers across Cornwall and um, Devon. And one of the things that always comes about, yes, their average age is on the higher end of the spectrum, and many of them don't have mobile phones. Many of them don't have mobile phones because they've heard of what type of things they do. They're tracking you, they're following you, they're, they're keeping all this information and they know when you go and buy some bread. Um, I'm sure Tesco's already knows when you buy some bread, but for some reason it's, there's all these different tracking elements and for their actual produce, for their crops, one thing that's becoming very valuable is their data, being able to show, okay, this is the whole history of this land. This is the history of where these plants have come from. So rather than this fear of um, robots coming in and taking our jobs, taking all these manual labor positions, the fear is instead we're going to be losing our data. Suddenly the thing that we're spending a lot of time and a lot of effort to create, nurture and grow is then going to belong to someone else and we're not going to benefit from that. Additionally, they do also um, very understandably have great concerns on returning investment because in agriculture it is a very tight margin and they don't get the luxury of setting the prices for the food that they're growing. If the weather changes and they're not able to deliver to that certain contract, they might not get anything. Instead, all of that is based further down the actual production line. So one of the important elements when you are putting out anything that's connected, anything that might be automated in agriculture is building that confidence and building that trust because that's fundamentally how agriculture has run for the last hundred years on that confidence, on that trust between different farmers, between your supplier and your distributor. And the, dare I say, Feel free to correct me if you believe I am wrong. The easiest way to show that trust is have it all on board. Whatever platform, whatever thing they are using, whatever stationary sensor they have in place, if all the data is kept there, you can then honestly say <coughs> to them, they are in control of their data. And that goes a long way. In terms of, is that how current practices are going? Not really. I mean, you can walk around um, in the countryside and if you've got a just a basic LoRa radio, you will pick up almost every single stationary device on site, on farms. Uh, that includes from Dutchie College um, all the way over to Riverford, where they've got stationary sensors monitoring the moisture, monitoring the temperature, the humidity, monitoring how many things have gone into one of their barns. Most of that is based on a LoRa protocol, which is all open source. It's very easy to access, it's very easy to ping, and it's being constantly openly published so they can look at their phones. Some farms, 
even have completely unprotected Wi-Fi because Farmer Giles can't get a signal down the bottom of his field for his little Chinese CCTV camera that he bought from eBay and he wants to be able to watch the cows. In terms of risk, uh, it doesn't take very long to realise just how bad a practice that really is, but it's a case of this is the most affordable option. This is the only way we can see to implement it. And before anyone mentions big data, you can't do that when you're collecting plant per plant and photos over time and stacking all of that and creating a 3D sculpture. One counter argument would be, yes, you can. It's just a bit more difficult. Whether that's a case of micro SD cards that can store a terabyte or even SSDs that can now store 100 terabytes of data. You can store all of that locally. You don't have to rely on cloud services for all of that. So case in point, hopefully I've made that clear. For devices, the more processing you can do on site locally, the better, the more you can build that trust and confidence. And if you've noticed, our robot has scaffolding between it, it drives itself around. How do the tracks know what the other track is doing or where they are? Yes, we do use a wireless connection, but that wireless connection is com completely embedded and custom. So instead of using a normal Wi-Fi protocol, so if you walk up to it with a phone, it will pop up. Instead, we've got a self-generated encryption key between the units. So after their first calibration with each other, they will continuously communicate in a hopefully without giving away too many of the secrets so people can then start to crack it in a completely random manner they'll decipher each other's data it's about keeping that control keeping all that processing on board and making it as difficult to as possible to really crack just reducing that risk so i've mentioned about some of the robotics in the field but what about the environmental living lab is that just a buzzword or is there something more behind it well a project that we've actually got coming up is the environmental living lab and it's a collaboration with the satapps catapult it, the idea is there's all of these technologies already in place used in so many other sectors and agriculture okay there might be some great uh, milking machines there might be some nice tractors ultimately it's not using the technology that's out there at the moment. So how can we start implementing and using these such as live satellite feeds to get the vegetation index, the NDVI spectrum to see how well plants are growing automatically so you don't need your own drone? And how can we do this in a secure and safe manner? Um, this project started up with a horse box. Inside that horse box is a very big battery and a very big computer and an excessive amount of screens so that everything can be done again on site then. Um, because of how dynamic agriculture it was mentioned and is not hard to imagine, because of how dynamic it is, because of how harsh a terrain, there is no one solution out there. And as much as I'd like to say, we have figured out the way to do it, that you can use this platform, you use this interconnective network and it will collect and maintain it all for you. That is not the case. And instead, we need to look at ways that what is the best way we can incorporate effective cost effective measures to get the best results. OK, Chinese made and manufactured cameras that have known exploits that are bought off of Amazon or eBay for about £12 put on farms isn't great. But how can we mitigate the risks that might come from that? Are there other solutions that we could use that are the same cost effective manner? And if not, OK, how can we set them up in a way where they aren't a risk? OK, they might see how many cows go past a certain patch of grass. But if there's buildings in the background, maybe it's worth ensuring those are physically blocked from the camera's view. Considerations such as that. Um, with the Living Lab project, as I mentioned with the horse box, with that processing capturing on site, what we're looking to do with that is actually create a digital twin of the farm. So these images here on the, I guess from where you're sat on the left there, 
Uh, that is a completely virtual version of a farm that was created in 15 minutes after the robot was deployed. And for anyone interested, that's running inside Unreal Engine 5, which gives fantastic fidelity and detail. So that's accurate down to centimeter level. In terms of the rather colorful red splatter, that is actually data from the robot soil sensors. So that's looking straight down, providing a cross-sectional cross analysis of that field. What it's like on a, on that case, a 30 centimeter basis. So that you can then see, okay, this part of the soil is very rich. Instead, we could start growing some far more valuable crops in that area and do our main bulk lower case produce in other areas where it will still grow, but it's not too concerned. We're not wasting as much resource. So my one thing that I would like for you all to take away from this talk, from this speech is really when developing agri-tech, when to creating sensors and technology for people that otherwise might not have the best experiences with IT, you've got to try and make it simple and you've got to ensure it is all performed on site so that they are effectively in control. It's a good practice whether that will be the case, who knows? Um, I'm sure things will work their way out some way or another. Thank you for listening.